I'm Alistair Ben. I'm at home right now uh, after spending about 12 weeks in the spring running workshops in Scotland and uh, the Gobi Desert and the north coast of Spain uh, and I was in Lapland also. So um, it's nice to be home and I want to share with you in this video some thoughts that uh, came to me an awful lot when I was away on these recent trips in that the how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis massively determines how productive I am as a creative person and equally how engaged I am with the landscape. Now one thing became very clear to me is that it's not the landscape that's changing, it's not the layout of the land that's necessarily changing on a day-to-day -day basis, it's who I am on a day-to-day -day basis. And if I was feeling melancholy or uh, lacking energy, then I would feel far less engaged with the landscape. And I could go back to the same beach or the same mountain or the same area the next day and feel completely different. Now, what's changing? It's me that's changing. So what I want to look at in this first part of the expressive landscape is how the landscape talks to us, uh, how it um, sends signals to us, how it whispers to us in that sibilant voice of, its, uh, of itself. Um, and it's us that chooses whether or not to listen or not. So this first step on the road to creativity is to look at the landscape in a very objective way in terms of what it can deliver for us um, and then to appreciate that it's how we react to it and how we engage with it is the key to our creativity. So let's dive straight in with some examples uh, and uh, hopefully you'll find this useful. If so, please subscribe and click that bell notification. You know the drill. When we first go to a location, what we tend to see is the big picture. So in these examples, we can see the ocean and some sea stacks. And in the second clip here, we can see some striations of rock underneath the surface. <clears throat> and what tends to happen is that we, we are instantly uh, engaged or not with a landscape. It's very easy to be engaged with uh, dramatic landscapes in good light because they are more engaging. It's as simple as that. Whereas a flat, featureless landscape in grey monochromatic light is less engaging. And what I want to look at in these examples is why that is the case. So if I come into Lightroom here and with the lights off, I've made a selection of just some of the raw files uh, in my catalogue from that particular morning. And as you can see, uh, these are isolated images of the main sea stack, uh, something the Spanish refer to colloquially as Skeletor because it looks kind of uh, sinister. Um, and what I've done is I've isolated the what is probably the most dynamic seascape in that area in various uh, f compositions to either emphasize or de-emphasize it. As the light developed and this rainbow appeared, I uh, ran along the beach as fast as I could uh, do so on the gravel and just tried to find something to juxtapose with that sky. And I found this uh, really incredible little rock. Um, and what I wanted to try and achieve here was dynamics. So having taken a static and calm and flat landscape and trying to create angularity and dynamics and energy and flow into it. And this is part of the photographic process, but this has less to do with composition and more to do with trying to create a final product. So what I want to look at here is first and foremost, how the landscape talks to us. What are its mechanisms and how can we identify these when we see them? So here we are back in Adobe Lightroom and I've literally just dived into my catalogue and grabbed 12 images that are mostly raw files or uh, files that have had a tiny, tiny amount of work done to them. So these are more or less out the camera. Um, and put together a collection that's just going to allow me to go through some of these elements that I want to discuss. And the very, very first thing to realize here is that when we walk through the landscape, what we are seeing is 
a, a, a massive amount of information. We're, we're seeing the whole picture. And, and what these images represent or what these sketches represent are isolations from within the big picture of the landscape. We know that in each of these frames there is something off to the left, there's something off to the right, there's something above and there's something below. And the focal length uh, represented here ranges all the way from about 26 millimeters at the widest end all the way up to 500 millimeters. So what I'm doing is I'm isolating things that I consider engaging. And that's all these are. It's not a composition. It's just, oh, I kind of like this. This is something that I'm engaging with. And what I want to do with these examples, and we'll go through them more or less one by one, is to decide what is it in these uh, distillations of landscapes that I'm engaging with. So, in the beginning, there was a straight line. And the thing about straight lines is, is that they're static. So as we just look at the image as it is right now, it's a static representation of out of focus surf and a nice pink sky. As soon as we add a couple of rocks out there on the horizon, the image now has some interest to it, or it now has some focal point. And even though the focal point is off there on the left hand side of the frame, it's still enough to break up that horizontal line. And it's the introduction of elements, lines, angles and dynamics and the relationship of those elements within the frame that is photography. That is what photography is about, is creating visual relationships. Um, so as we continue to add content to this frame, we will quite clearly see where the dynamics are being introduced and how they actually interact with each other. By adding some of the foreground rocks, we're now creating depth. So we have something at the front of the frame that is not only slightly angular in the way that the rocks curve up from the bottom right to the top left, uh, or from right to left as it were, um, we're also showing depth because the ones in the front feel closer. They have more detail in them, certainly than the horizon. So we can see now that we have three dimensionality being added to our frame. And by the time I look at the full frame here, we can see that the dynamics are increased by, in particular, the most striking angle in the composition, which is down in that bottom right hand corner. It's the steepest angle um, and therefore the, that line, that angle uh, has more dynamics because the steeper the angle, the more dynamic it is until it reaches the point where it's vertical again, in which case it is now static. So let's have a look at some more examples and uh, understand how these elements come together. In the second example, we've taken this angle to as near vertical as possible on the left hand side here and Although there is a slight curve to it, there is a very, very slight diagonal to it as well. So it's not a completely vertical line and obviously the tree sticking out there on the left about half height is also breaking up the monotony of that vertical line. The key element here is way off to the right hand side of the frame where we have a far more dynamic part of the landscape which is made up of more intriguing angles. Um, and it's the diffused nature of the foggy conditions that's actually making this feel three-dimensional and pushing that stuff away off to the right-hand side into the distance there. So again, we're creating visual relationships between foreground elements and background elements. And the word I want to introduce here is transitions, because a transition takes you from one place to another place from one thing to another thing, from one texture to another texture, or from one color to another color. And it's the introduction of these transitions that can add dynamics and interest to our photography as well. So in terms of what I was responding to here, it was that natural depth uh, and diffusion. And the other word I'll introduce here is atmosphere. Atmosphere is a big, big influence on our, on our emotions. 
so here we have graphic dynamic textures on the left and we have diffused dynamic textures on the right. Uh, so again, we're coming up with a situation here which is very, very dynamic, but at the same time, it's calm and it's quite ethereal. So these emotional words that I'm starting to introduce into this commentary uh, are extremely important because if you're going to feel the landscape, you need to understand emotional language. By the time we start to introduce curves into our sketches, for want of a better word, we can see that the, the general flow of the image works in a very similar way to diagonals and straight line diagonals. And this image actually has both. It has a straight line diagonal leading from the bottom left up to the right there. And then there's also a curve. Uh, and then obviously the curve linking that sort of foreground sand dune into the back is uh, quite a striking curve as well. Now, what curves do is that, as I said, they work in a very similar way to straight line diagonals and the directionality is the same in that they will take you in the same direction, but it's a softer, more sinuous uh, journey. And the general feel is softer, calmer, uh, less dynamic even though there is a very subconscious dynamic to it. So curves are an excellent way to soften up images uh, and the feeling that we have when we perceive these curves in the field is usually uh, a very calming one um, as opposed to jagged diagonals, which as you can see up in the top right hand corner of this frame, if we were to isolate that section uh, like this, we will see how that image in its own right is decidedly more dynamic, decidedly more angular uh, and has a much, much more um, energetic feel. So remember very much that curves will work the same way as a diagonal in terms of leading the eye through the frame in a particular direction, but it's a much, much softer transition. So in this first part of the expressive landscape, what I wanted to do is look at the fundamentals of geometry in that the landscape is nothing more than an interaction of lines, curves, shapes, patterns, textures, colors. Um, and all of these things are just interacting with each other and themselves and creating a patchwork of interconnectivity. Uh, how we perceive that landscape and how we interact with that landscape is an entirely personal thing. Uh, although we do tend to have a preference towards um, dramatic landscapes, uh, which is why so many people go to the Grand Canyon every year or Yosemite Valley uh, or any number of other places around the world that are dramatic. And what do those dramatic things tend to have in common? They tend to be angular and impressive. They have vertical change. There's very few, uh, very, very famous landscapes uh, in terms of photography that are flat and featureless. Um, very, very few. And if they are, then they have strong foreground components like jaggy angular patterns or colorful rocks or something like that. There's something dynamic in that landscape that, that elevates it above flat and boring. So, what I really want to finish this little session with is this whole concept of why we go out into the landscape in the first place. Because for me, the big paradigm shift was when I realized that I went out into the landscape because I love being in the landscape and I'm not going out there just to make photographs. So the thing I found with going out there with the expectation of making photographs was that it created a very judgmental attitude when I was there. The clouds were wrong, the light was wrong, the conditions were wrong, the height of the tide was wrong, uh, there was too many other people there, um, whatever it may be. You know, there was some element of expectation that was, I was leaving the landscape, uh, or I was expecting the landscape to fulfill my expectation. Um, now, when I go into the field, I'm much more happy just to be there, and I'm absolutely tuned in to 
engaging with the landscape because it's it's why I'm there in the first place. This is just be there, enjoy being there, notice things that intrigue me, find relationships between things that interest me. Um, and if those criteria come together and I feel inspired to do so, then I'll get my camera out of the bag and start sketching the landscape. I make those sketches without any expectation of them turning into photographs um, because that isn't why I'm there. Uh, and whether they, these sketches turn into photographs or not at some point in the future is reliant on me having some kind of connection with that raw file when I'm sat in front of the computer as I am this afternoon. So by separating the time in the field with time in the landscape, it's allowing me, sorry, time in the field to time in front of the computer, it's allowing me to uh, reconnect with the landscape in a far more intimate and emotional way uh, without any expectation of its performance or my performance. Uh, the best thing I ever did to myself was forgive myself um, and give myself the permission not to be perfect all the time, to just go into the field and be because as I mentioned earlier on in the, in the movie, some days I go into the field and I don't feel like making photographs. Some days I go into the field and I don't engage with the landscape. So why should I be making photographs at those times? So I hope you've enjoyed this little movie and there'll be another one along in a few days time. Um, this series is going to continue. Then the second part of the expressive landscape, I'm going to look specifically at color and some of the other things that can trigger us in terms of how the landscape talks to us and how that makes us feel. Because I'm very, very into uh, formulating this whole concept that it's how the landscape makes us feel is a massive, massive trigger for our creativity. And that's what this series is all about, finding creativity. So if you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. Uh, I would be delighted if you would do that. Give me a thumbs up click that bell notification, all that usual stuff. So until next time, thanks very much for watching and uh, have a great time. Bye.